that is overweight. We've talked about getting moving. What about the diet? And is there any optimal diet? Big question. Definitely gut microbiome. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely uh, one that focuses on the gut microbiome. But interestingly... Probably Mediterranean style yeah, diet. it's probably yeah. the same... Oh, yeah, yeah. It's probably the same yeah. thing, right? Yeah, exactly. And th this is what's interesting in the fitness industry. So f for listeners like who probably aren't in the fitness industry, we've gone very much, although you've maybe seen this on like mainstream media, towards calories are all that matter. Yes. And you just need to be in a calorie deficit. Now, there is an element of this, this that is true, as in you will lose fat if you're in an energy deficit because fat is the body's primary store of energy. If you eat less than you consume, then that energy has to come from somewhere. It comes like from primarily your fat, right? There might be a bit of lean tissue lost as well and some glycogen stores, but whatever. You will lose body fat if you're consistently in a deficit. But then what people don't consider is like what people are eating anymore. And I kind of like the calorie deficit message because so many people used to get fixated on like never having carbs or like right. never ever having a burger or never having food that they enjoy and that was really over restrictive or like pushing sort of like clean eating and that kind of turned into orthorexia and people being scared of eating what's like, orthorexia sorry i don't know the exact definition okay. right no, but no, it's, it's okay. essentially it's when people become obsessed with their health to the extent that it's negative for them so like I'd be like terrified that, I don't know, something we ate at lunch might have like had oh, some oil okay. in or something, right? And it. I'm like, oh, what, was it olive oil? Was it natural olive Got oil it. or like blah, blah, Got it. So it's just like the over... I understand. Yeah, you've getting gone, kind of neurotic <clears throat> about health. You've gone to the opposite end of... Yeah, you've gone spectrum. too far. You've gone, yeah. you've, gone, <laughs> yeah, you've gone too far, yeah. But then I think to counteract that, we've maybe gone too far the other way of being like, it doesn't matter what you eat just be in a deficit. Now, if fat loss alone was all you cared about, then you could argue that's a good message. But I would even within that not argue that because actually sticking to, I don't know, let's say a 500 calorie deficit, if you're eating primarily whole foods and a lot of pro or a decent amount of protein, actually quite easy to do. If you're trying to do that while eating primarily highly processed junk food, which is like very Moorish, and not particularly satiating, actually a really hard thing to do. So they kind of both are more related than people make out. It's not just what yeah. you eat or how much you eat. It's like they impact yeah. each other. You're speaking about this if it fits your macros type movement. Yeah. And popularized probably about 10 years ago. Yeah. Pop tarts. Pop tarts. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And it was just like, to contextualize it, it doesn't matter what you eat so long as you hit your target calorie number your protein, your fat and your carbohydrate number. And really it doesn't matter what the makeup is of those micro, macronutrients and um, what's on your plate and going into your mouth so long as you hit those numbers. Yeah. So in context of that, like having a big plate of veg might be the same in that context as like a, I don't know, so like a pop tart or something, right? In terms like of calorie high content. Sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Or just like, yeah. well, I hit my carbs, but like what... Got it. What were the carbs made up of? Got and it. like, how satiating was that? How much food volume did you have? Yep. What's the impact on your gut microbiome? The all these stuff. Well, <clears throat> we can talk about the microbiome piece. Uh, but before I do that, a thought experiment for you. If you had two people and they were the exact same genetically, so you'd cloned them, and uh, all other factors and variables were the same, training probably being the most um, relevant one, but all other environmental stimuli are the same. Um, and one of them was having a, if it fits your macros, Pop-Tart heavy, Haribo heavy, chocolate heavy, McDonald's heavy diet. And the other one was having the beautiful Mediterranean microbiome friendly, high fiber, micronutrient dense, minimally processed food. Would their body composition look the same or would they be different? Okay, so... I think, and, and this is just in terms of body composition, because we kind of already spoke about like skin, hair, nails probably look better if you're having like a Mediterranean right. style diet versus just eating processed right. foods. Their body composition would probably be similar, at least short term. I would imagine that would impact like your mood, which would impact your training intensity, which yeah. would impact your motivation. Like it yeah. will all have impacts. But in terms, like I imagined for a period of time, at least body composition would be relatively similar. The other thing that 
people forget about. But I also don't speak about that much because I think it often overcomplicates the message is the caloric availability of food. So if you're eating primarily whole food that has high fiber, high protein, you actually don't fully absorb as much of those calories as you do processed foods. So if I ate 200 calories worth of Mars bar versus 200 calories worth of, I don't know, broccoli or something higher in protein, maybe like a chicken breast or something. I don't actually absorb the same amount of calories from both, even though they are the same calories. Oh, interesting. So there's there's that impact as well. And I guess over time that might add up. So the person who's eating 2000 calories of whole foods might actually be absorbing less than the person who's eating 2000 calories of like quote unquote junk food. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. And the other thing that I w- is upset is the, I don't know if it's the right word or the wrong word, but kind of upset me with it if it fits your macros is yes, people are doing it to improve their body composition. Many people have a drive to get healthier more generally. And in adopting the if it fits your macros approach, you might be improving your body composition, which in turn improves your overall health and well being. But you're not doing what's optimal for your health. You, yeah. know, you you need a high fiber diet with the right kind of fats, with minimal sugar to be at your healthiest. So you might actually be shortening your lifespan in adopting the if it fits your macros approach. Um, and you probably feel a bit rubbish. Yeah. And it's hard because a lot of these effects, like a lot of the effects of health aren't like immediate, now, right? Yeah. So you can see the almost immediate effects of changes in body composition like you know it might take me 12 weeks to lose this amount of fat but like that's pretty immediate you don't know the impact of 12 years of sticking to this kind of diet or like the long-term impacts of eating like we know that now there's like a link between highly or processed meat and certain types of cancer and things like that actually there's probably a lot that we don't quite know yet and those things are so hard to study that if we have mechanistic rationale for it, I'm kind of like, I'd rather just like stick to a diet. And and like you said, it actually makes you feel better. Yep. How has your diet changed over the years? And we should bring it back to you did sports science, but yeah, we're we're getting technical now and and getting into the the detail, which, which we definitely should do, but back to your journey. So the sports science thing happened. Was this at Edinburgh Uni? Yeah. Yeah. So when I was at Edinburgh, I did sports science and I was really involved in athletics. And when I did that, I actually didn't think about my diet at all. And then I got quite into rowing and I was learning like sports nutrition, sports performance nutrition. So it's quite like carb heavy. And then I remember finishing rowing for the season and I'd really hurt my back and I decided I wasn't going to go back. And I was like, I'm going to get in incredible shape. And this was the time when it was like cool to be like a sponsored athlete. Right. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to get, I said to my flatmate, I was like, I'm going to get a sponsorship from like a supplement company. And he was like, yeah, 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 whatever. Is that so, not cool anymore? No. I don't is, think it's is, really, is, is now it's, it's more just like influencers who, right. who get that kind of stuff. But anyway, um, <laughs> right. I was in when it was cool, right? Yes. Uh, so that you was- were sponsored by somebody. Hold on a second. Can I re- let me think about this. Why is USN? Yes. In, was it USN? Yeah. <laughs> in France. Yeah. It's in my head. So I worked with them oh, for a while. Funny. Yeah. Um, but the whole point was you had to be in shape, right? So yes. all I did was cut carbs. Now, there's right. no like secret behind that. I just was creating a calorie deficit. But because it was such a huge element of my diet, and, and I've never been one that particularly likes being over analytical about especially food, I think it can like, for some people it works really well, but for me it was never something that I particularly wanted to do. So if I was just like, well, I'm not going to eat carbs, it actually made it so much easier just to cut calories without thinking about cutting calories. So that's what I did. And then I got in shape and then I started doing a bit of like fitness modeling and stuff. And I went down that route for a while. Um, And then I remember a really weird diet that I used to do called carb backloading. Did you ever do this? (laughs) So that was great because exactly. you could basically binge eat yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then say it was part of your yeah. diet. You're, you're bringing back so many memories for me. Um, now, let me just think about this one. So the car backloading was from was developed by this guy who was a physicist. Kiefer. Kiefer, yes. I can't remember his first name. I anyway. can't remember either. And, and he said, well, because of all this hormonal metabolic stuff, you should have all your carbs at night. Do you know what though? I and, quite I loved the science behind it, even though it wasn't legit. What was the so is the science legit or not? I mean, 
Because I don't know. Like, um, so it kind of like it makes theoretical sense, right? So his whole thing was you don't eat carbs all day. So you're very insulin sensitive by the evening. And then you were meant to train before you ate the carbs, right? Uh, and the to training your sensitivity even more. increases insulin sensitivity, but also um, uh, GLUT4 regulators would come like, you know, would be more on the surface of the cell, which means that yep. this was the theory. Those... Uh, calories that you ate or the carbs that you ate would only go into your muscle couldn't be stored as fat right, <laughs> right. obviously yes because right. that's how it works because it'd be so sensitive they just suck it all up it, yeah <laughs> okay. exactly so uh, okay. but what was interesting and in looking back on it now is I was like it was easier for me to stick to that because I had some kind of theory behind why it was working rather than just being like you need to be in a calorie deficit I was like oh no no I have to be quite like strict with this because I need to keep my insulin sensitivity during the day yeah. and then I'll train and then at night like you know I'd be eating like pastries and yeah. stuff at that, night. I was just about to say I think he recommended pastries yeah he did Didn't he was he? like what he was, like, some pastries? kind of cherry pastry I never managed to find it <laughs> yeah. I I'm laughing so much because you've just brought back all these memories of me being at the Aberdeen University weightlifting club with all the other people that were there we we were doing the car backloading thing we trained really hard and then we all sort of invariably went to the supermarket and bought these cream filled apple or raspberry filled pastry things and just ate like five or six of them. Now in hindsight, that is not a healthy way to live your life. No, uh, no absolutely <laughs> not. And then I think, I think actually... It, you know, it wasn't so bad for us because we were already quite lean, could yeah. probably completely handle that glucose load, yeah. you know, and we were obviously within like sort of energy balance ranges. Why I'd be really worried about it now or promoting it to people who kind of like weren't in that situation is that a lot of people struggle with binge eating or yeah. massively overeating in the evening to the extent that it becomes like quite uncontrollable and then to the extent that it can sometimes lead to eating disorders. Yeah. That's almost the encouragement of binge eating. Like, restrict yourself all day Indeed. and then eat as much as you want That's afterwards. Not